Hello gamers, this is Tom Seidner, the Lonely Gamer. And even though I'm a lonely gamer, sometimes people show up to my house and they want to play games. And sometimes a lot of people show up to my house and want to play games. And that's kind of hard for the lonely gamer because I'm used to being lonely. But when a lot of people show up, then i got to find a game that will incorporate a lot of people. Um, a lot of my friends don't like to split up into different groups. They want to be in a large group so that they can talk to each other and kind of enjoy the games together. So today I put together for you lonely gamers a list of games, about 15, that can be played with up to 8 players. I'm going to talk about these games in no particular order. So let's go and let's get started. So the first game I want to talk about is one of the most popular games of Gen Con last year. It is Codenames. Codenames is a game by uh, Vlada Chavatil. Um, there are two versions now. A new version was released this year called um, Codenames Pictures. And last year's hit of Gen Con and pretty much of the year was Standard Codenames. In code names, you play in um, two different teams. Each team has a spy master, and each team has field officers. The spy master is going to try to give clues to lead the field officers to select the right and appropriate cards that fit into their grid. The spy master is going to try to give them a one-word clue that will lead them to picking these field operatives. The game sets up in a grid. Each team has a specific order of cards that belong to them. As you can see here, the red team has the cards set up in the red location. The blue team has the cards set up in the blue location. And then there's also one spy. You can see down here in the corner, if anybody guesses that card, the team automatically loses. Turns go back and forth. The spy master giving a one word clue and the field officers trying to select the cards that go along with that clue. They must touch the card they touch the card and it's wrong, then their turn ends and they either get a neutral, if it's a neutral, they get the other team's token, if it's actually one that belongs to the other team, or if it's the spy, the spy is put out and they lose the game. The game goes back and forth until either one team picks the spy and loses or one team picks all of their operatives from the cards. If you get sick of playing it with words, you can switch to pictures. So the new game has pictures. It's pretty much the same game, only you have cards with pictures on them instead of cards with words on them. And there's also rules in there for mixing them so you can have words and pictures. The game plays up to 8 plus players. So if you have a large group of 10, 12 or more, you can always play code names. The next game on our list is Spyfall. Spyfall is a three to eight player game. Spyfall is a game where all the players are playing operatives and one person is a spy. And you gotta figure out who the spy is. When playing Spyfall, you grab a packet. There's several packets in this game. You open the packet. You randomly give out cards to each player. One player is the spy. The other players are shown their location. So in this case it's the casino. Each location card has something at the bottom telling what the people are. So this person is the card shark and this person is the head of security and this person is the bartender. Everybody knows where they're at and who they are except for the spy. The spy has no idea what the location is. So people are going around the table trying to ask questions of each other trying to determine if they know where they're at. So you might ask a question to somebody like, hey, can we gamble at this location? If the person says no, then you're pretty sure they're the spy. Once you know, think you know who the spy is, you call out that person. If they are the spy, the operatives win. If they're not the spy, the spy wins. So it's a deduction game for lots of players trying to figure out who the spy is. It is limited by the number of cards in the packet, so it is limited to eight players. Spyfall comes with several different locations, so there's plenty of replayability in this package. 
It also comes with a map of all the different locations. So if you want to make the game a little easier, you can put the map out and let people look at the possible locations. Uh, I like to play it without this map because I just think it makes it a lot more fun if they have no idea where they possibly could be. And that's Spyfall. The next game on our list is another up to eight player game, and that is Elder Sign. This is put out by Fantasy Flight in their silver line. And in this game, you play a bunch of detectives trying to find out what's going on in the spooky museum. In Elder Sign, each person plays a host of characters. There's several different characters to choose from in Elder Signs, and each character has its own special ability to help in the game. The characters are trying to move through rooms in the spooky museum, and each room has a set of dice that is needed to complete the room. Dice are rolled, they're played onto the cards, and once the cards are completed, they have a reward, or they have something bad that happens if you don't complete the room properly. Once rooms are completed, characters get them as trophies, and trophies can be used to purchase helpful items within the game. But as you're playing, be careful because time is against you. Every time the clock strikes 12, you draw a card and something bad happens. So you're trying to complete the rooms in a specific amount of time. You as a group are trying to gain Elder Signs, which this one requires 12. Gain Elder Signs before the big bad evolves and eats everybody. If you can do it in time, you win the game. The next game on our list is Cash and Guns. Cash and Guns is put out by Repo Games and it's designed by Ludwig Moblank. Cash and Guns is set up for four to eight players. It's limited only by the number of guns you have. So there are actually expansions that you can buy, but the base game comes with eight guns. So everybody gets a gun. Everybody gets their player. There is a steps card that tells the player who is the boss, what they do on their turn, because the boss player is the person who is going to control the game for the round. Each person has a hand of cards consisting of click cards and bang cards. Whenever you play a round, you select one face down. When you point your gun at somebody and you reveal your card, if it is a bang, you shoot the person and they are knocked out for the round. If it is a click, then they're okay, you didn't load your gun. The object of the game is to get loot. There's all kinds of loot cards. During a round, you select a packet of loot cards, you place them face out. This is what everybody is fighting for in the round. Everybody who's left in a round and not knocked out actually gets to take a loot card. You take them in order, starting with the boss and moving around the table. Yes, some people will get multiple loot cards. The object is to have the most loot at the end of all the rounds. If somebody shoots you, you get a wound. If you get three wounds, you're knocked out of the game. If you're knocked out of the game, none of your loot counts. Be the surviving player with the most loot at the end of the game and win cash and guns. The next game on our list is Formula D by Asmodee. In Formula D, you play race car drivers. Who doesn't want to be a race car driver? This game will play up to 10 players right out of the box. It has a huge, beautiful board. The board is two-sided, so you can play either side you want. And the board comes in two pieces. Each player gets a shifter card. It has two sides. It has a basic side for those really casual players, and it has a more advanced side for players who are bigger gamers but want a larger game. The shifter goes into this nice little tray here, and then everybody gets a shift knob that goes into their shifter, and this is how you adjust your speed as you're playing the game. Speed adjustment is based on dice rolls. So the faster you're going, the larger the dice you roll. These are not standard dice. Uh, some of these dice do not have low numbers, like this dice has one and two on it. So if you're in first gear, you roll the dice and you're going to only be moving one or two spaces. Uh, 
If you get up to here, this only has 7, 8, 9, and 10 on it. So you're going to do 7, 8, 9, or 10 if you roll this. And then you get up to the big boy here, which goes up to 30, 30 spaces. Everybody gets a unique little car. These things are tiny, so don't leave these out where your dog or your child will eat them. But their car is placed on the track. When they roll the dice, they move the number of marks on the dice, so one, two, three. You can also change lanes as part of your move. You're trying to get around the track as fast as you can, but be careful because there's dangerous curves. Each curve has a number associated with it and you have to stop in that curve at least that many times. So this one you have to stop one, but th and this one over here you have to stop three, three times in this curve. So the object is to try not to s slide through the curves because if you slide through the curves, bad things happen, you wreck your car, and you could be out of the game. Another thing is do not want to hit other players. So um, if you hit other players or you in the curves, you're going to put damage on your car, and as things become damaged on your car, it doesn't work as well. To make the game more fun, you can give each player a character, which gives them a different persona for their driving, which also affects the game. So this game has a lot of scalability, it plays a lot of players, and it is a really fun game. The next game in the list is Valley of the Kings. Now Valley of the Kings, straight out of the box, is not set up for a large group. In fact, if you buy Valley of the Kings, you can play four players. But the nice thing about Valley of the Kings, they sell this in three different packs. You have Valley of the Kings, you have Valley of the Kings Afterlife, and you have Valley of the Kings Last Rites. And for every one of these you buy, you can play four more players. So I actually have two of them here. I have Valley of the Kings and Valley of the Kings Afterlife, and I can play eight players with this game. Valley of the King is a deck building game, so just like other deck building games, you start with a starting hand of cards, you shuffle those cards, you use those cards to build your deck. The interesting thing about Valley of the Kings is that it uses a pyramid mechanic where you can only buy cards that are in the lower level of the pyramid. What cards you buy also affects what cards are going to be available for other people. So if you buy this card, then this card is going to drop down, this card is going to drop down, and these are going to be the three items that are available for the next player. If you buy the center card, you get to choose which one of these cards drops down. So you could choose this one because you think the next player doesn't want it, then this drops down. At the end of your turn, you refill the pyramid by putting new cards from the top down. Another interesting thing that this card introduced was the promotion of cards. So cards are not worth anything in your hand in this game. You have to have them promoted into your tomb to be worth anything at the end of the game. This is also a set collection game, so as you can see there's different colors of cards. I have a yellow and a tan and an orange here. You get points based on how many cards of the different sets you have. Now, in this game there are duplicates and duplicates don't count. So you want to have different unique cards in your sets. So, very interesting game. Plays a lot of players. Like I said, comes in three different versions. It comes in Valley of the Kings, Afterlife, and Last Rites. The next game on our list is Bang. Specifically Bang the Dice Game. Bang the Card Game also plays eight players, but I have actually replaced Bang the Card Game with Bang the Dice Game because it's so much easier to deal with a few dice than a whole stack of cards. I've got the original game and the Old Saloon expansion. I've got a review for this if you want to see what comes in that. But in Bang the Dice Game, people play on a team, but they don't know who's on their team. So you could be the renegade, you could be the sheriff, you could be the outlaws, you could be the deputies. The deputies and the sheriffs are working together to try to defeat the outlaws. The outlaws are trying to defeat the sheriff and the deputy, and the renegades are trying to defeat everybody. So you don't know who the other people on your team are, so that's part of the game. You have to try to figure out who is on your team. The only person who's known is the sheriff, 
the sheriff starts face up, so if you're an outlaw, you know that uh, you can start hitting the sheriff, but if you start hitting the sheriff too much, then the deputies are going to know it, and they're going to start hitting you. You have life, and you keep track of your life based on bullets. When your life is gone, you're out of the game. You can also get shot by Indian arrows. If all the arrows are depleted, then the, the Indians attack. Whoever has the most arrows will also take damage. You can also give out character cards in this game, and each character has a special ability, which adds to the game. Very fun game, put out by D.V. Godochi, and um, also this has Spanish on it, so if you're a Spanish teacher and want a game that you can play in your Spanish class, which actually will help them learn Spanish, this is the game for you. The next game on the list is Citadels. Citadels is put out by Fantasy Flight, another one of its Silver Line games, and in Citadels, you play a person trying to create a city. Each person has a handful of district cards. Each district card is based on a color and also has a gold value associated with it. When you play cards in your district, into your tableau, you're going to get benefits based on how many of the different colors you have. You get benefits at the end of the game if you have one of each color. You also get benefits during the game for having certain colors. Each round, a person is going to draft a character for the round, so your character changes every round. Each character does something specific. We have the architect, which lets you draw extra city cards. We have the magician, which lets you do magic tricks and exchange hands with other players. We have the merchant, which gives you gold and gives you extra gold for all your green cities. You have the warlord that gives you extra gold for all your red cities and also lets you destroy other people's cities. People don't like this card. You have the king, which is the person who controls the game, gets to pick first, and also gets gold for yellow cities. You have the bishop. He gets gold for blue cities. And he also protects you with divine faith from somebody destroying your cities. You have the assassin, one of the most hated cards in the game. You can actually kill somebody's character before they ever get to take their turn. And then the thief, and the thief gets to steal gold from one player every turn. The game comes with really nice gold chips that you use for money and a nice little king stand up. Once somebody has built eight districts in their city, the game ends. The person with the highest gold score from all their cities is the winner. This game plays eight players and there is actually a reprint coming out this year of Citadels. I've heard rumors that the artwork on the new version is going to be phenomenal so keep an eye out for that. Arr. The next game on our list is Dread Curse. This is a pirate game. Everybody's playing a pirate and you're trying to get the most treasure. This game is put out by Smirk and Dagger. In this game each player is going to select a crew at the beginning of each round. And the crew they select that round is going to depend on what they get to do that round. The bulk of the game is drawing treasure from the bag. You draw treasure from the bag and you leave it face down in front of you. Everybody knows how many coins you have, but they don't know the value of the coins you have. Some coins range from value 1 to value 5. And one of the coins is the dreaded black spot. If you have the dreaded black spot at the end of the game, you lose. You cannot win the game with the black spot. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to entice people to steal coins from you and hopefully steal the black spot from you. The different characters let you do different things like stealing coins from people taking more coins from the bag, or drawing some of these cards here. You'll have a hand of cards, and these cards are instant cards, and you can play these cards at different times to affect the game. You play the game until there's no more booty in the bag. Once the bag is empty, then everybody tallies up their score. Whoever has the most gold wins. If you have the black dot, you are eliminated. The next game on our list is Ultimate Warriors by Matigo Games. The unique thing about this game is 
the box is part of the game. So the box is an arena. You actually are going to be fighting in the arena. Each person takes one of the eight characters. Some characters are large and they're easy to hit, but they have lots of life. Some characters are small. They're hard to hit, but they have very few life. So choose wisely when you choose your character. Are you fast and nimble? Are you big and strong? It could depend on whether or not you win the game. Each character comes with a packet of items. You get your action cards. You get your health points. And you get special ability tokens. On your turn, people combating each other are going to secretly play out their combat card and then reveal it to see what they do. Some of the things you can do is move, you can do a melee attack, and you can do a ranged attack. Each of your cards also has a defense value. So you're trying to compete against the other players using your cards. Once you play a card, you cannot get that card back. You have to kind of manage your hand and use your cards a lot wisely because once they're used, you don't get them back. Each person also has a character reference card which shows how many life you have and how much defense you have before you start playing your cards. Be the last person standing and if there's a tie, be the last person the most health from other players at the end and you could be the ultimate warrior. The next game on the list is one of my game group's all-time favorites and that is Shadow Hunters. Shadow Hunters is put out by Z-Man Games and it's a game where all the players play either a shadow or a hunter. It's a hidden roles game where nobody knows who's on their team and you're trying to kill people without being sure if they're actually helping you or trying to hurt you. Each person is secretly given a role. You're either going to be a hunter, a shadow, or a neutral. My game group only uses neutral if we have an odd number of players, otherwise we divide the shadows and the hunters up evenly. Each shadow and hunter have a special ability, but that special ability can only be used if your person is revealed. So sometimes it's advantageous to reveal your person early, become a target, but be able to use your special ability. Each person has a specific life, and if you end up at the top of your life, you die and can be knocked out of the games. The game has a unique rolling mechanic. You roll two dice, and they're actually two different type of dice. You add those together, and that's where you can move on the board. So I rolled a six. I can go to six. That takes me to the church. The church lets me draw a white card. Each location has a special ability that helps you out in the game. So the church lets you draw white cards. The underworld gate lets you draw any color card you want. The hermit's cabin lets you draw green cards. The weird woods lets you damage other people or heal yourself. The cemetery lets you draw black cards. And the erstwhile altar lets you steal equipment from other players. There are three different card types in the game. There are green cards. Green cards you use to help determine who is on your team. So you read the card, it may say, I bet you're a shadow. If not, take a damage. You give it to one other player, the person looks at it, they either take a damage or they don't. It helps you determine whether they're on your team or not. The black cards are usually bad things, so they'll either hurt you or they'll give you benefits that help you. There's a lot of equipment cards in the black, like a chainsaw that gives you one extra damage when you damage another player. And then the white cards, they're supposed to be good cards. They have a lot of cards like healing cards and cards that help the hunters. The black cards have a lot more cards that help the shadows. You play through the game until either all the shadows are eliminated or all the hunters are eliminated. And in the case of neutrals, each neutral has its own winning condition. So it could be something like be the first person to die or be the first person to kill somebody. And if the neutral meets their winning condition, the game also ends. This is a very fun game and probably one of the best strategic games for eight players. The next game on the list is The Resistance. The Resistance is a werewolf type game. It will play up to 10 players and has a minimum of five players. So this one actually requires more than the normal to actually play this game. The nice thing about this game above and beyond werewolf is that this game does not require a narrator. 
One of the things about Werewolf and one of the reasons that my game group does not like to play Werewolf is because nobody wants to play the Moderator. So in this game, there's two teams. There are the Resistance, the blue team, and the Spies, the red team. Depending on the number of players, you're going to pick one of these score tracks. This is the eight player score track. It tells you how many spies are in the game. And what's going to happen is the resistance is going to try to complete missions within this game. They're going to select the number of players that are going to actually compete in the mission. They're wanting to select players that are resistance and they're not wanting to select the spies because the spies are going to throw a monkey wrench into the mission. So once the mission starts, then each player is going to secretly approve or reject the mission. If the mission receives any rejected in the pool, then you know you had a spy involved and that mission is going to fail. Some missions actually require two fails to actually fail the mission. If the resistance completes more missions than they fail, they win the game. If the spies manage to fort more missions than, than the resistance completes, they win. Their team wins. So, very good game. No moderator required. Can play up to 10 players. This game is put out by Indie Boards and Games. The next three games come with a caveat. Strictly out of the box, they will not play 8 player, but with an expansion, they will also play 8 player. The first one is Star Trek 5 Year Mission. Star Trek 5 Year Mission, if you get the Wesley Crusher expansion card, uh, I think you can pick that up maybe at Board Game Geek or someplace else. This will play eight players. It plays seven players out of the box without that card. Each player plays a crew member of either the original Star Trek Enterprise or of the Next Generation Enterprise. One player must play the captain. Once you decide whether you're going to play the original or the next generation, you select your ship. You've got the original ship or the next generation ship. The object of the game is to complete alerts depending on your skill level. So, ensign level is 10 alerts, lieutenant is 12, lieutenant commander is 14, commander is 16, and captain are 18. Admiral is 20. So, you're going to have alerts that come up during your play. Alerts come in three different types. You have blue alerts, which are the easy alerts. You have yellow alerts, which are the mid alerts. And you have red alerts, which are the hard alerts. Winning the game is based on completing alerts that have victory points. If an alert has a victory point, it will have a little uh, Star Trek symbol up here in the top left of the card. And um, those will go into your uh, victory point pile. And that's how you determine if you win or not. So if you are playing the Ensign and you get 10 of these completed, then you win the game. Blue alerts, about a quarter of these have victory points on them. Yellow alerts, half of these have victory points on them. And red alerts, all of them have victory points on them. On a turn, somebody is going to fire an alert. So the first thing you do on your turn is you pick one of the alerts. You may pick a blue alert. Some alerts will actually tell you to spawn a different alert, so the blue alert could tell you to spawn a yellow alert, and as this one says, this yellow one spawns a red alert, so when picking the easy alerts, sometimes it's a cascade effect, which puts you in deep trouble. Some alerts are prime objectives. These alerts have to be completed before any other alert, or, you, or these alerts will fail, so if I completed this one while this one was out, this one would fail because it's a prime objective. There's also timed alerts. Some alerts have to be completed before the time runs out or they fail. If you fail five alerts, you lose the game. During the game, your ship can become damaged. As the ship becomes damaged, you move this token farther and farther this way. This limits the type of alerts you can pull up on your turn. So if the token was here, only red alerts could be pulled for the turn. You have to use dice red dice, in fact, to actually heal your ship. So a six dice could be spent on my turn to heal the ship here. A five or above could be spent here to heal the ship. A five above here and a four or above here. So during your turn you're going to be rolling dice, using those dice to try to complete missions and also using those dice to heal your ship. 
Some missions require that you put out dice and can be put out on consecutive turns. So this one has a one of yellow, a one of red, and a one of blue. They can be put out like the one of yellow on my turn and the one of blue on somebody else's turn. Some alerts require that all dice be put out in a single turn. So this one, because everything's in a black box, the five of red or above, three of blue or lower, and the two of blue or lower all have to be played in the same turn to be able to play them on their card. Once a card is filled up with the appropriate dice, then that card is removed from the game. If it has a victory point, it goes in your victory point pile. Some cards also have a special ability on them. If it has a special ability on it, it goes to the person who actually completed the card, and the person can use that special ability on any of their consecutive next turns. That's it. Complete the number of victory points that you need to win the game. Don't let your ship get blown up, and don't fail five missions. If you do that, you, as one of the members of the Star Trek Enterprise, will complete your five-year mission. This game is one of the favorite games of my game group because we have a lot of Star Trek fans and I think the theme really draws them in. It's a fun, cooperative game where nobody's really hurting anybody else and so it's, 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 it's very fun to play and uh, has a lot of unique decisions that you have to make in the game. The next game on the list is King of Tokyo by Aiello. This game also has the precursor that you need an expansion to play more than six players. This is six players out of the box, but with an expansion you can play several more players. I have a couple expansions and I can play up to nine players in this game. In King of Tokyo, each person gets to play a monster from a old sci-fi movie like um, Pandakati or Boogie Woogie or The King, it's King Kong, The Kraken, Gigazor, Alienoid, or everybody's favorite, Cyber Bunny. Each person has a stand-up representation of their monster, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to get into Tokyo. Throughout the game, you're going to be getting energy from rolling your dice, and you can use those, that energy to buy cards that actually help you upgrade your player. On your turn, it's a Yahtzee-style dice rolling game where you roll the dice and you try to keep the dice that are going to help you in the game. Claws attack other people. Energy gives you money. And numbers in combination actually allow you to advance on the score track. But be careful because you have a life. And if your life gets dropped to zero, you die and you're out of the game. When you're on the sidelines looking in at Tokyo, you could actually attack the person who is in Tokyo. So if you roll two claws, you could do two damage to this person. When that happens, this person has the ability to suck you in. So if you attack somebody and they're in Tokyo, they can suck you in. They remove themselves from Tokyo and they put you in Tokyo. Now you are going to be the center of attention of everybody at the table. If you're in Tokyo and you roll claws, you get to attack everybody else at the table. So if I roll two claws, I could do two damage to everybody else at the table. Staying in Tokyo gets you points when it comes back around to your turn. So if you're in Tokyo, when your turn comes around, you get extra points. Be the first person to get their points scores up to 20 and win the game. Also within the game, whenever you roll these energy crystals, you get these little tokens that represent money. Uh, these things look like little green gelatin. Do not eat them. Everybody at the table thinks they're candy. Don't eat them. You use them to buy cards, and cards will give you special abilities like one extra roll each turn, or your maximum health is increased by two, and so on and so forth. These cards can be purchased on your turn by paying the money that's up in the upper left of the card. The last game on this list is actually a category of games. Also requires expansions to play a large amount of players, but it's the zombie side games. The original zombie side, or my favorite, the zombie side Black Plague. In Zombicide, you play as a group of adventurers or just survivalists trying to survive in an onslaught of zombies. You play a character moving through a tile-based board where you're getting overrun by regular walker zombies, runner zombies, fatties, 
abominations, necromancers, wolves, skeleton zombies. The, the number of zombies that you're fighting becomes overwhelming. Each character starts out pretty basic and each character has a character card which allows them to advance in the game. So as the character kills zombies, they get XP, which lets them get special abilities in the game. But remember, as you become more powerful in the game, more zombies come out. As your characters become more powerful, more zombies are spawned. So when you pull a spawn card, if your characters are all at level blue, which is the low level, there may only be one zombie. But up here, when you're in the red, there's seven zombies. This game gets crazy. There's zombie wave after zombie wave that comes after you and your players have to work together to try to keep them at bay. Some zombies are easy to kill, like walkers, where you can hit them with one hit. Some zombies are almost impossible to kill, like these abominations, which require special weapons that you find while searching through the areas. So, this is a very fun game. This is a very hectic and mayhem game. But, with expansions, this game can play up to 10 players and be very fun. So that's it gamers, the next time a bunch of people show up at your house, don't think that you can't coax them into a game of some sort, just remember these 15 games will play at least 8 players, and so have fun, enjoy your friends, and have a board game party. Till next time, this is The Lonely Gamer, happy gaming! Gamers, this is Tom Seidner, the Lonely Gamer. And even though I'm a Lonely Gamer, sometimes people show up to my house and they want to play games. And sometimes a lot of people show up to my house and want to play games. And that's kind of hard for the Lonely Gamer because I'm used to being lonely. But when a lot of people show up, then I gotta find a game that'll incorporate a lot of people. Um, a lot of my friends don't like to split up into different groups. They want to be in a large group so that they can talk to each other and kind of enjoy the games together. So today I put together for you lonely gamers a list of games, about 15, that can be played with up to 8 players. I'm going to talk about these games in no particular order, so let's go and let's get started. So the first game I want to talk about is one of the most popular games of Gen Con last year. It is Codenames. Codenames is a game by uh, Vlada Chavdil. Um There are two versions now. A new version was released this year called um, Codenames Pictures and last year's hit of Gen Con and pretty much of the year was Standard Codenames. In Codenames you play in um, two different teams. Each team has a spy master and each team has field officers. The spy master is going to try to give clues to lead the field officers to select the right and appropriate cards that fit into their grid. The spy master is going to try to give them a one word clue that will lead them to picking these field operatives. The game sets up in a grid. Each team has a specific order of cards that belong to them. As you can see here, the red team has the cards set up in the red location. The blue team has the cards set up in the blue location. And then there's also one spy you can see down here in the corner, if anybody guesses that card, the team automatically loses. Turns go back and forth, the spy master giving a one word clue, and the field officers trying to select the cards that go along with that clue. They must touch the card, they touch the card and it's wrong, then their turn ends and they either get a neutral, if it's a neutral, they get the other team's token, if it's actually one that belongs to the other team, or if it's the spy, the spy is put out and they lose the game. The game goes back and forth until either one team picks the spy and loses or one team picks all of their operatives from the cards. If you get sick of playing it with words, you can switch to pictures. So the new game has pictures, it's pretty much the same game, only you have cards with pictures on them instead of cards with words on them. And there's also rules in there for mixing them so you can have words and pictures. The game plays up to eight plus players so if you have a large group of 10, 12 or more you can always play code names. 
The next game on our list is Spyfall. Spyfall is a three to eight player game. Spyfall is a game where all the players are playing operatives and one person is a spy and you gotta figure out who the spy is. When playing Spyfall, you grab a packet. There's several packets in this game. You open the packet. You randomly give out cards to each player. One player is the spy. The other players are shown their location. So in this case, it's the casino. Each location card has something at the bottom telling what the people are. So this person is the card shark, and this person is the head of security, and this person is the bartender. Everybody knows where they're at and who they are except for the spy. The spy has no idea what the location is. So people are going around the table trying to ask questions of each other, trying to determine if they know where they're at. So you might ask a question to somebody like, hey, can we gamble at this location? If the person says no, then you're pretty sure they're the spy. Once you know, think you know who the spy is, you call out that person. If they are the spy, the operatives win. If they're not the spy, the spy wins. So it's a deduction game for lots of players trying to figure out who the spy is. It is limited by the number of cards in the packet, so it is limited to eight players. Spyfall comes with several different locations, so there's plenty of replayability in this package. It also comes with a map of all the different locations, so if you want to make the game a little easier, you can put the map out and let people look at the possible locations. Uh, I like to play it without this map because I just think it makes it a lot more fun if they have no idea where they possibly could be. And that's Spyfall. The next game on our list is another up to eight player game, and that is Elder Sign. This is put out by Fantasy Flight in their Silver Line. And in this game, you play a bunch of detectives trying to find out what's going on in the spooky museum. In Elder Sign, each person plays a host of characters. There's several different characters to choose from in Elder Signs, and each character has his own special ability to help in the game. The characters are trying to move through rooms in the spooky museum and each room has a set of dice that is needed to complete the room. Dice are rolled, they're played onto the cards and once the cards are completed they have a reward or they have something bad that happens if you don't complete the room properly. Once rooms are completed Characters get them as trophies, and trophies can be used to purchase helpful items within the game. But as you're playing, be careful because time is against you. Every time the clock strikes 12, you draw a card and something bad happens. So you're trying to complete the rooms in a specific amount of time. You as a group are trying to gain Elder Signs, which this one requires 12, gain Elder Signs before the big bad evolves and eats everybody. If you can do it in time, you win the game. The next game on our list is Cash and Guns. Cash and Guns is put out by Repo Games and it's designed by Ludwig Moblank. Cash and Guns is set up for four to eight players. It's limited only by the number of guns you have. So there are actually expansions that you can buy, but the base game comes with eight guns. So everybody gets a gun. Everybody gets their player. There is a steps card that tells the player who is the boss what they do on their turn because the boss player is the person who is going to control the game for the round. Each person has a hand of cards consisting of click cards and bang cards. Whenever you play a round, you select one face down. When you point your gun at somebody and you reveal your card, if it is a bang, you shoot the person and they are knocked out for the round. If it is a click, then they're okay, you didn't load your gun. The object of the game is to get loot. There's all kinds of loot cards. During a round, you select a packet of loot cards, you place them face out. This is what everybody is fighting for in the round. 
Everybody who's left in a round and not knocked out actually gets to take a loot card. You take them in order, starting with the boss and moving around the table. Yes, some people will get multiple loot cards. The object is to have the most loot at the end of all the rounds. If somebody shoots you, you get a wound. If you get three wounds, you're knocked out of the game. If you're knocked out of the game, none of your loot counts. Be the surviving player with the most loot at the end of the game and win cash and guns. The next game on our list is Formula D by Asmodee. In Formula D, you play race car drivers. Who doesn't want to be a race car driver? This game will play up to 10 players right out of the box. It has a huge, beautiful board. The board is two-sided, so you can play either side you want. And the board comes in two pieces. Each player gets a shifter card. It has two sides. It has a basic side for those really casual players, and it has a more advanced side for players who are bigger gamers but want a larger game. The shifter goes into this nice little tray here, and then everybody gets a shift knob that goes into their shifter, and this is how you adjust your speed as you're playing the game. Speed adjustment is based on dice rolls. So the faster you're going, the larger the dice you roll. These are not standard dice. Uh, some of these dice do not have low numbers, like this dice has one and two on it. So if you're in first gear, you roll the dice and you're going to only be moving one or two spaces. Uh, if you get up to here, this only has seven, eight, nine, and 10 on it. So you're going to move seven, eight, nine, or 10 if you roll this. And then you get up to the big boy here, which goes up to 30, 30 spaces. Everybody gets a unique little car. These things are tiny, so don't leave these out where your dog or your child will eat them. But their car is placed on the track. When they roll the dice, they move the number of marks on the dice. So one, two, three. You can also change lanes as part of your move. You're trying to get around the track as fast as you can. But be careful because there's dangerous curves. Each curve has a number associated with it and you have to stop in that curve at least that many times. So this one you have to stop one but, and this one over here you have to stop three, three times in this curve. So the object is to try not to slide through the curves because if you slide through the curves, bad things happen, you wreck